First of all, I want to say thank everyone for coming today. Some of you were already in a meeting earlier this morning, and here we are again, so I appreciate hanging on for the day. My name is Kirsten Workman. I am the Nutrient Management and Environmental Sustainability Specialist at ProDairy, a program out of Cornell University. And I want to thank the whole team who put this workshop together. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Partners for Healthy Watersheds is a group of groups um, and uh, all farmer-based groups that are really focused on watershed health and protection and what farmers and agriculture can do to improve and protect water quality um, in, our, in our lakes and streams. And so as those of us who wander around all the different water quality meetings and work with farmers and land uh, managers, uh, a topic that has continued to come up over time is uh, tile drainage. And so again, in the, in the spirit of teamwork, um, I get to bring my two worlds together. Before coming to Cornell University, I worked for University of Vermont. And the same question, frankly, was coming up in Lake Champlain watershed. Uh, and we were lucky enough to, at a very same moment, uh, hire on Dr. Joshua Faulkner as our climate change coordinator. Um, and he has a great background um, in engineering and hydrology. And he's gonna share with you today some science about the basics of tile drainage, but also what we know today sort of in the Northeast uh, and what are the strategies we use tile drainage for and what are sort of the water quality implications of that. And then building after uh, Dr. Faulkner's presentation, we have Laura Kleber here from Minor Institute um, here in New York State, but she uh, has done quite a bit of work at, um, on both sides of the lake uh, in Lake Champlain, but, um, and she has some great new research to share with us too. Um, all very much focused on what are the water quality implications of this practice we use on our farms. Um, one thing I do want to highlight about today, just from a um, housekeeping standpoint, there's about 40 something of us in this room. There's about 140 folks online. Um, and so we're going to try and manage both. So Emma, thank goodness for Emma, <laughs> is helping us manage that today. Um, and so if we have questions, we're going to repeat those questions so our online audience can hear. And likewise, when our audience has questions, we'll repeat repeat those out so you guys understand what those are. Um, after each presentation, we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Um, and then at the end, if you guys want to hang on um, after three and we still have questions to sort of get to, our speakers are willing to stay a little bit longer if, that, if that's needed. Um, but we definitely want this to be pr productive and informative, um, sort of a starting point for us all to kind of get on the same page. Um, and to that, I would love to, um, just a quick show of hands, I, uh, I was privy to the registration information, so I got a good handle that we have a really good mixture of folks, both online um, and here in the room. But if, for those of you in the room, if you're a farmer, if you would just raise your hand. Awesome. If you um, uh, work for a county government or agency, so a water conservation district, Awesome, NRCS, we have a lot of those folks. Any nonprofit, sort of water quality minded groups, great. Awesome, so we have quite a mixture. I'm sure I missed some representation there, but um, I don't wanna waste any more time. We've got a lot to cover today. Um, and so that, with that, I welcome um, Dr. Joshua Faulkner, who drove here this morning from Vermont <laughs> and came through the snow, even though it was 85 degrees last week. And he's gonna start us off, so. So yeah, um, good to be here. Um, Kirsten did a great job of um, giving the outline of what I hope to do in about 45 minutes and then leave some time for for questions. Um, so I'm just going to I'm just going to jump right in here. Um, maybe I'm going to jump. Right. Uh -oh. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. So you can't see the title, but it's um, tile drainage. Um, climate change and water quality, and I think all these things are really tightly linked, and I, I think I'll explain why, why I believe that. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So, unfortunately, I'll tell you what the, the top says here. So, this is a, a average annual precipitation in the Northeast over the past 100 years or so, um, and you see this sloping blue line. Um, we've seen an increase of about four inches um, over the past century um, in the Northeast. What's very different though, that's not such a big deal, right? That's multiple generations on a farm, lots of time to adapt to that. Um, however, when you drill into some of the climate district specific data, and, and I should say a lot of what I'm saying comes from the perspective of Vermont working in the Champlain Valley, 
Um, it is a little bit different, but it's also not that far away. Like I said, I drove, I drove over here this morning about four and a half hours. So, but that's the lens I have. So in Vermont, when we dig into the climate district specific data, we see a very different picture in terms of increasing precipitation. Um, and I'm showing that here in the middle of your screen. Um, we see increases in south, south, southern Vermont of five inches, increases in the Champlain Valley of seven inches, and increases in northeast Vermont of nine inches. And that's in 30 years. So previously, we're looking at four inches over 100 years. But when we look in the, at the data in detail, we see much greater increases over, over 30 years. And that's, for a lot of folks, that's maybe one generation on the farm, you know? Um, and that's something that has farmers back on their heels, wondering what they're gonna do with all this extra water. All right, and it's not just that it's getting wetter. As we all know, I think the headline story for climate change and, and water regimes in the Northeast is this, is that we're seeing um, more frequent heavy storms. And I'm sorry, again, it's kind of cutting off my title here. Um, maybe Emma can try to fix that. But this is, a, this is a figure from the last, I think it was the most recent national climate assessment that shows a percentage increase in very heavy precipitation from 1958 to 2016. And so every region of the country has seen this, but none that, to the degree that we've seen in the Northeast with a 55% increase. Thank you very much, much better. All right, so, you know, this, this is, you know, it's this increased precipitation, but it's also these heavy storms. And what I think is really interesting is when I go to farms, um, <clears throat> talk to farmers, you know, I, I, I have climate change in my title, but I don't start the conversation there. And regardless of where people are in terms of their kind of, you know, acceptance of the signs around climate change, et cetera, et cetera, everyone agrees on this one. They're like, the storms are so much heavier than they used to be. We're getting them more frequently, um, and they're wondering what to do about that. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'll just use the. Nope, maybe I won't. Okay, thank you. All right, and so of course this has effects um, on the farm, right? This is me standing. I'm about six six three, um, standing in a gully from one single um, rainstorm in the summer of 2015 um, in a cornfield in Chittenden County, Vermont, um, and I have a you know I have a silly grin on my face because I'm a soil and water engineer, and I'd really never seen gully erosion in an actively farmed field like this, except when I was in grad school at Cornell studying the Dust Bowl, you know, and this was, this was a first for me, but this is becoming more and more common with these extreme storms. And then the <clears throat> USDA folks, um, this modeling group out of the Midwest has done some, some work, and they project that with this increase in annual precipitation, we'll see this disproportionate increase in erosion. And granted, that's in a, that's in a corn soybean rotation, um, different soils, um, but still it should give us, you know, um, reason for concern here in the Northeast as we think about how we're gonna manage our soils and how we're gonna handle this excess water. And then it's not just impacts on, of course, not just impacts on natural resources and farm resources around soil, and water, it also impacts on the farm's bottom line and productivity, right? So this is um, this is why Vermont crops fail. Why Vermont crops fail, and I'm I, I'm sure there's probably one of these out there for New York as well. I, I don't know that it looks much different, um, but this is based upon where why crop insurance payments are made for what reason. And I know this is probably a little hard to read, but I'll tell you. Half the pie, over half the pie, this purple piece of the pie from 2001 to 2010 is due to excess moisture. So this is a real problem that's affecting farmers. It's always, certainly always affected farmers. You know, it's, Northeast has always been wet, but our, I would argue it's really kind of coming to a head in the past 15 to 20 years. And, the, and this, this um, pie chart supports that. All right, so what are farmers doing about this? Um, and I would argue that drainage um, is probably the number one way, at least the farmers, our field crop 
producers that I work with, dairy farmers, are responding to climate change. And it's different drainage approaches, but most often it's installation of tile drainage, which is what we're here to talk about today. And tile drainage, I'll say, first of all, it's, it's nothing new. Artificial drainage goes all the way back to 200 BC. They were, they were using different, different ways of draining land artificially than, than we do now. It's called tile drainage because it used to be made of terracotta clay. Before that, it was made of people have used all sorts of different materials for producing drainage channels um, below the root zone of a crop. From flat stone stacked in, in an upside down U shape to brush that's literally just buried so it creates a cavity in the soil to hollowed out wood, all sorts of different ways people have tried to do this. From terracotta clay, we then jumped to what is now probably 95% of tile that goes in. It's not actually clay, it is this corrugated plastic pipe. That's typically four inches in diameter, has slits in it to allow water to enter it, and it's placed at anywhere from three to four and a half feet underground typically. Um, and its sole purpose is to reduce, lower the water table below the root zone of the crop, okay? Benefits of this. So there's really big, big, two, two big benefits. And one is what you might assume based upon, you know, in terms of um, lowering that, that water table below the root zone of the crop, it improves crop production, it improves yield for farmers, but maybe more importantly, it reduces that year to year variability. And that becomes even more important in this era of climate change where we have droughty years, really wet years. Maybe we have to have a droughty early season followed by a really wet late season. It reduces, it gets kind of gets farms off that roller coaster of yield, right? It tries to level things out so they have some amount of predictability um, in terms of what, what yields are going to look like in that year. So that's huge. So I know this is probably too small for you to see again. But I just want to show um, the degree of the yield improvement that it can provide. This first, this chart here in the middle is from Ontario, not too far from here. A variety of different crops here. We have red wheat, corn, wheat, um, white beans, and soybeans. And yield increases from tile anywhere from 25%, 20, 22% up to um, 40%. And then the longest running drainage tile study that I'm aware of is in Ohio and over 25 years there, they measured yields and they saw increases of about 30% um, because, of, because of drainage tile. This comes from New York. This is um, actually, this is a, a drainage extension specialist that I worked with um, when I was in grad school at Cornell. And these are data that he collected on forage yields as a function of drainage. Um, you can see here on the far left, we have no drainage, surface drainage next one in, then tile drainage at 100 foot spacing, and then tile drainage at 50 foot spacing. So pretty decent yield improvements because of, um, because of tile. Now I want to jump right back here after I talked about yield, and I want to talk about this number two here, benefits of drainage. And this is trafficability. And this is, in some ways, can be even more important than that um, lowering the water table out of the roots on the crop and improving yield, because it allows farmers to do what they need to do when they need to do it. They can get in the field earlier in the spring, they can stay in the field later in the fall. Um, they're able to manage the crop the way it needs to be managed. What we've also seen, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, this also allows implementation of some conservation practices um, that would not be possible without a drier soil condition. All right, so what does tile look like when it goes in? So it can go in in a variety of different configurations and designs. Um, it used to be there's tile, you know, over 100 years old in the U.S. that is a lot of it's random is what we call it. So it would be just a one line out into a depression, a wet spot in a field. You know, on the farm I grew up on, we had you know, some of those lines that just hit those, you know, the bottom of a slope in a pasture field or something to kind of dry out that spot. Um, lots of random tile out there. As time progressed and technology improved, we started to move toward more systematic 
designs. Um, and that's what you're seeing here, like a herringbone design, a parallel design, um, so on and so forth. And this modern machinery really allows for this to happen. And there you can see an aerial view of a field in Ontario that's just received a modern pattern tile, tile drainage. Okay, so a lot of folks ask, well, you know, I work with a lot of, from dairy farmers to, to vegetable growers and they're, they're interested in drainage, but they're also very aware of drought. Um, and we're seeing more and more drought, droughty conditions with, with climate change in the summer. And they're concerned if they drain their fields, they'll re be removing water that could otherwise be used by their crops. And that's not actually the case. So we have, you can kind of think about water and soil, you have two different buckets of water. You have free water and you have plant available water. And so a good analogy, a analogy I like to use is if you think about a sponge and you have a tub of water and you soak that sponge in the water and you pick it up out, there's going to be some drainage from that sponge back into the tub of water. That's what we call free water. That's water that drains via gravity. And that's what happens when you saturate soil during a rainstorm for that next 24, 36, 48 hours even there's a drainage of water from that profile and that's free water. And that's water that's not available to plants. That's water that's going to move vertically downward into the top. The water that's left in the soil after that water drains out, that's the water that's plant available. So if you think about that sponge again, so that sponge is pretty wet. If you squeeze that sponge, wring that sponge out, we get lots more water. And so it takes extra force to get that water and that's the force that's required. That's the force that the plant applies to that water to get that, get that water out of the soil. So with that drainage water, that's not water that's available to the crops. So we do see no real influence on droughty conditions and removing excess water, uh, removing water that would be available to crops um, with drainage time. We also, also counterintuitively, do see a benefit in dry years and wet years. So if you kind of think about the little thought experiment here, um, if you think about a, a really, um, if you're if a wet spring followed by a dry summer. So in that wet spring, we have crops in the ground, we have a high water table um, because we don't have drainage. And so that water table, because it's high, it limits crop, it limits root growth downward. So, you know, in a really wet spring, You'll go out in the summer, you can pull corn plants up and all, all the roots have stayed right on the surface because they didn't want to go deeper. If that land was drained, you would have deeper root growth within the spring so that later on when it dries up, those roots are then able to access the deeper water during that, that ju late July, August time period. So really tile has benefits in the wet years and the dry years. <laughs> Probably the number one drainage uh, design factor in tile drainage is the space of, of the top. Um, and this is, you know, this has changed through time. This essentially affects the rate of water removal from the field. Um, there's lots of different ways to determine this. Vermont has a drainage guide. I am almost certain New York has a drainage guide. Does anyone know off the top of their head? I think I've seen it at one point. Okay. All right. Yep. There was, there, there was one here, which is spacing. <laughs> okay. NRCS publishes it. Um, yeah. So anyway, this has recommendations for spacing. You can calculate it based on soil if you want to get, you know, really sharpen your pencil. Um, but most often this is based upon local knowledge of contractors and farmers in your area that have fields that have a similar type of soil in it. And that's where you're going to um, find your best source of, of information on what spacing would be recommended. And there's also financials involved here, right? Um, tile drainage is not a cheap practice to, to install. Um, so there's some consideration of, of spacing of how closely you want to space your tile because that is the number one factor that will affect the cost of that tile installation as well. And I'm not gonna, we don't need to talk about all those economic factors, but I will, I will show this, that there's a sweet spot in there, right? So if you, so what we're seeing here is net profit on the x-axis, 
um, on the y-axis and then drain spacing on the x-axis. So if you have your tile space really close together, it's really expensive to install. And so you're not going to realize that profit. And then vice versa, if you space it really wide, um, you're not going to have much of an effect on the actual crop in terms of reducing, reducing the water table. So you're not going to realize the profit. So there's a sweet spot in the middle. So it does, it does really matter. Spacing is, is very important. And this, this is another slide from Larry Gehring. Okay, so that's drainage 101. And I just wanna say, that's kind of the benefit part to the farm. And I, I do wanna say here, I have a couple of slides. Drainage is nothing new. I said all the way back to 200 BC. This is a quote I pulled from the Ag Experiment Station Report in Vermont from 1912. And if you can't read this, this says the question then is not whether one can afford to drain, but whether one can afford not to drain. So the Northeast has always been wet, no question about that. And drainage has always been an important practice for productive farms. And then we, of course, if you look across the border here, I'm sure many of you have been to this. This is the drain tile museum outside of Geneva, you know, where drainage tile was being used as early as 1835. Um, this fellow, John Johnson, brought it here, the first place in the United States. It was used, was on his farm there. And I believe he increased yield um, almost tenfold in grain um, with the with the usage of, of drainage tiles. So it's not a new practice. All right, but there's trouble on paradise, right? So there are some very um, troubling concerns around environmental impact related to tile drainage. And, you know, this, it took a while for science to catch up with what was happening here. And I'm gonna talk about phosphorus. Phosphorus is primarily what we're, we're interested in when it comes to tile drainage and, and water quality in, in the Northeast because we're, well, I wanna say a lot of the Northeast because we're draining to freshwater bodies. And those are often most limited by phosphorus, not nitrogen. And it's phosphorus that results in the harmful algal blooms, the eutrophication, et cetera, et cetera. So from here on out, most of our environmental conversation will be about phosphorus. So having said that, for a long time, we thought, you know, we know nitrogen moves into tile drains because um, nitrogen moves with water. It's negatively charged. It doesn't sorb to the soil. Like that's going to happen. We know nitrogen leaches, right? We did not think that phosphorus leaches because phosphorus grabs hold of soil really tightly. And we said, okay, there's no concern about phosphorus moving into tile drains. However, starting, um, there was actually early work in New York. There was, uh, I want to say like um, late 90s or mid 90s. And then there was a lot of work done in the Western Lake Erie Basin starting about 15 to 20 years ago. Um, that said, whoa, you know, there is some, there is phosphorus leaving our fields through these tile drains, and we need to start studying this and figure out what's going on and what to do about it. And Kevin King, here's a King paper. He's, you know, kind of did a fantastic review of the science around phosphorus transport and tile drainage, and most of that work um, comes from the, the Western Lake Erie Basin. And then Vermont, now other, you know, a lot of states responded to this. They said, oh, we should test our tile as well. Vermont did the same thing. We passed some new drainage rules, um, a lot of study and reports and started to fund um, field research. And that's what kind of how I got engaged into this, into this um, conversation and this, this work around tile drainage. And one of the primary driving factors for why we see phosphorus um, being transported into tile drains is this kind of phenomenon known as preferential flow. So like I said, phosphorus typically bonds really tightly to soil particles. But when we have channels like old worm channels and old root channels and cracking clay soil in fields that can go down to three to four feet deep, that's when we have trouble because the water that flows down through that channel, the phosphorus doesn't have an opportunity to interact with the soil like it would if you think about a sandy soil where the water just kind of soaks in and goes through the whole, the whole matrix, the whole bulk soil profile. We have this rapid kind of short circuiting of the soil with preferential flow. And that's what's led to, um, and is all, most often responsible for a lot of the phosphorus transport. This is a photo of, this is um, actually from my 
grad lab at Cornell, and you can kind of see the actual preferential flow paths here. We used Dodd Tracer, dumped it in the soil. We had this kind of soaking of the soil in the upper layer, about the upper foot or so. And then you see these rapid streaks of blue water that find those wormholes and those macrophores and zip right down. And so if those intersect with the tile drain, then we essentially have surface water that's going directly into our tile drain. All right, so what does the scientific literature say? So from elsewhere, from not just the Lake Erie Basin, but from elsewhere in the country. So I tried to summarize this, and I know this is too small, so I'm going to read it. Um, but what do we, what do we, what do we know about phosphorus transport and tile drains so far um, from elsewhere, not necessarily from the Northeast? So number one, most of the phosphorus load comes from storm events and high flow. So it's really not that slow drain of the soil profile um, in between storms. You know, that kind of when you walk to a tile outlet and you see, oh, maybe a gallon a minute or something, that's not what's carrying the nutrients. It's when we have one of those heavy storms and water starts to move through those preferential flow paths, that's when we see the bulk of the load of the phosphorus. Most phosphorus load occurs during the wet, cool, non-growing season. Um, so that's true for tile and that's also true for surface runoff, of course. When we have saturated soils or snow-covered soils during the non-growing season, when crops are not actively taking up nutrients and water. This one's a little bit surprising. No-till and perennial sod systems often have higher P loads in drainage style than a tilled, a conventionally tilled system. Um, and that's because in those no-till systems and those sod systems, we have a lot more of those wormholes and root channels and preferential flow paths for water to flow through. Um, and, you know, this is almost like soil health heresy, but it's the tillage in a tilled system that breaks up those, those channels and prevents that rapid movement. Okay, and I'm not saying anything about surface runoff here. We're only talking about subsurface flow. All right, so we also know on the second row here that higher soil test phosphorus, so the more phosphorus concentration in the soil, the higher air phosphorus concentration is gonna be in the water that flows through that soil, that leaves that soil in tile. Soils prone to preferential flow have higher P loads. I, kind of, I think I've kind of beaten that, that one to death. Um, deeper tiles have higher loads, but lower concentrations. So if you think about a deeper tile, it has higher loads simply because it has more water. So it's, if you're at a three foot depth versus a four foot depth, at that four foot depth, you have another foot of soil to drain. So you have more water leaving that profile. And even if it's a low concentration, the total amount, the total poundage of phosphorus can be greater. Spacing has no significant influence. So, so um, doesn't matter if they're spaced far apart or close together, spacing has no significant influence. Um, and our fi more finely textured, like our heavier soils, our clay soils, um, which are, do a much better job of grabbing a hold of phosphorus and sorting phosphorus, um, <clears throat> the loss from those soils is still greater than it would be from a much coarser soil, like a sandy loam or something like that. And that's because those fine textured soils, those heavy soils, form those preferential flow paths. And then finally, high water table. Um, when we have high water tables, we get, um, there's not, uh, we, we deplete the oxygen in the soil and we start to see reduced conditions. Um, and that's when we actually see the soil want to release phosphorus back into the water, even if it's held pretty tightly. So in those systems where, um, in years where the drainage tile just can't keep up, we're likely to see um, desorption of phosphorus from, from the soil itself. All right, so those, that's what we know around kind of field characteristics. What do we know around um, nutrient management? And again, this comes from, most of this comes from the Lake Erie Basin. I borrowed this slide from Kevin King, who's done, a, like I said, done a lot of work in that part of the world. Um, and I just kind of want to 
talk through some of these that are all related to how we apply our nutrients, when we apply them, at what rate we apply them, et cetera, et cetera. So for starters, organic pea sources, so manures, um, tend to pose a greater risk of leaching of phosphorus than our synthetic sources. Um, and that's because those synthetic sources can be targeted at the right time when the crop's going to utilize it, where manure has more of a slow release than the synthetic sources. The potential for phosphorus transport um, to tile drains significantly increases with an increase in pea application rate. That's, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Um, pea losses in tile drains are generally greater when we apply manure on the surface of the soil than when we inject it and or when we incorporate it. And that's, that can be a little counterintuitive too if you think, well, if you're injecting this or you incorporate it, you're getting it down into the soil closer to the tile. But when you incorporate it or inject it, you essentially ensure that all that phosphorus in the manure is interacting with the soil. So it's having a chance to bind onto that soil versus if you applied it on the surface of the soil, it just sits there waiting on it to rain and it doesn't really, really have a chance to interact with the soil. There's a greater risk of pea transport when, when phosphorus is applied in the fall and winter course, because we're not using, crops are not actively taking up that phosphorus. That applies to surface losses as well. And then um, again, same thing with surface losses. If we have rainfall soon after phosphorus applications, um, that will increase the risk of, of pea loss to tile drains. And that's directly linked to that preferential flow, flow paths that, that I mentioned earlier. All right, so that's what we know. Um, and so it's really complicated. Uh, benefits to the farm, but we have some documented environmental concerns. Um, and then we have a lot of lingering questions as well. And these are things that we kind of noodle on in Vermont. We have, for one, uh, it was documented, this is a Wayne Skaggs, who was like the, you know, did a lot of the early tile drainage research on spacing and, and everything that goes around what, surrounding the hydrology. Um, but he showed really early on that tile drainage actually decreases surface runoff, which makes sense, right? If you have more water soaking into the soil and leaving through a tile line, that means you have less water to run off the surface of the soil. And so when you have that draining that soil profile, it, it essentially dries the soil out quicker. So when we have the next rainfall, that rainfall can then soak in and it won't run off the top, reducing surface erosion, reducing surface nutrient loss. So it's like, oh, okay, so we got surface losses, subsurface losses, but we also have this thing, this, this thing happening where we're reducing surface losses. So some unanswered questions here are the net benefit. And then we hear, you know, I hear from Vermont farmers that, you know, had a lot of goalie erosion until I put in tile drainage and now I don't have that, you know, and that's because they're seeing more water move through the subsurface and less water move across the surface that can lead to that, that erosion. And that's kind of, you know, I mean, we've spent decades working on reducing erosion. All right. And then we have this with a tile drain field, we have more phosphorus being removed by the crop because the yield is improved in that crop. You know, nothing's worse to see you know, a crop that is in poor condition um, doesn't reach its full potential. And I think, think of all that phosphorus that was in that field and nitrogen in that field that was not taken up into that crop, but that, because that crop didn't re reach its full yield potential. So we also have that going on. And then we have some work that was done by Heather Darby in Northwestern Vermont, um, surveying farmers and asking about how tile drainage and adoption of best management practices intersect and found that with when fields are tiled, farmers are more able to implement things like cover crops, reduced tillage and no till. Okay. As you think about if that soil's drier in the fall, they have more opportunity to get on there and get the cover crop planted. Um, a drier soil reduces the, the hesitation to do no till because at least in in the Champlain Valley, high clay soils, there's a lot of risk of compaction. People don't want to get on wet soils and cause that compaction. So we have this kind of great thing happening here 
with enabling some soil health practices to occur. All right. Oh, and I just mentioned compaction. So compaction is something I'm really interested in, study compaction a lot. And I just wanted to show that the influence of soil moisture, how it interacts is interacts with the risk of compaction. So here's a, you know, this is an old ag engineering figure that shows a tractor tire over top of soil and hard dry soil, moist, moist soil, and then a wet soil on the far right. You can see the wetter the soil is, the deeper those um, compactive forces are conveyed into the soil profile, right? Because of all that moisture in the soil. So as we have wetter soils with climate change, um, and if those soils are undrained, we have potentially this, uh, this, this um, potential for increase in compaction in those soils. And compacted soils lead to higher runoff um, amounts. All right, so that's kind of the good, the bad, lots of questions. Um, and kind of where that leaves us, and at least with our research is, um, we really need to do some local research to try to inform what we know from the Midwest. And then ultimately, what are we gonna do about it? What does it mean in terms of management for the farm, for particular cropping systems, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where we start with some of our field skills. I'm just gonna talk about three fields, um, results from three different, um, actually two different studies from, from three fields. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about um, what we're getting ready to do or what we've started and hope to have results on in terms of where our research is going around tile drainage because there's still lots of those, lots of those unanswered questions. So we do a lot of work at the field scale. Um, I'm going to talk about three fields here. These are all in Addison County, which is just across the border on the other side of Champlain. Um, I'm going to have one paired system, so it's two tile outlets within the same field. The tile, the tile systems are separate. And then I have one unpaired system, so it's just a tile outlet within, within a field um, on its own. These are all fairly new tile. They're pattern tile, um, 25 foot spacing, I believe, which is kind of the going, the going spacing now in some of the heavy clays in Champlain Valley. Um, all these fields were fall injected with manure they all had covered crops and they all had just a really light spring tillage um, at planting, right before planting to Im improve seed to soil contact. And here's just, this is just kind of a, um, a schematic here showing um, for the paired field, we had 18 acres in one drainage network and 12 acres in another drainage network. And we also monitored surface flow from these um, sub watersheds within that field, but I'm not going to talk about surface um, flow at this point. All right, in order to do this monitoring, um, we often excavate around the tile outlet, just oh, 20 feet up from the out from the um, where it discharges, um, and we put in a manhole. We cut the main. And we put on an electromagnetic flow meter so that we can very accurately measure flow. And then we connect that to an automatic sampling water sampling unit so that we sample more often when the flow is higher and less often when the flow is lower. Um, for this, we sample both for the storms and we also sample for those base flow periods, that slow drain um, period um, in between the storms. All right, so what did we find? So this is from 2020 and 2021. And this is how the data we killed. This was published in 2022. So just for starters, and I think it's important to note that these were fairly dry years, 2020 and 2021 during them. Um, we had in 2020, 56% of normal precipitation. In 2021, we had 68% of normal precipitation. So here are the loads. And uh, it's, it's again a little small. Um, so we had uh, Dead Creek North and Dead Creek South. Um, in 2020, we had, this is pounds per acre, phosphorus pounds per acre. So kind of think about that. Um, here in, on Northfield in 2020, we saw about 0.74 pounds per acre leave the field. In 20, in the South field in 2020, we saw 0.7 pounds per acre leave the field. In 2021, saw 1.12 pounds per acre in North. And in 20 and South, 0.9 
in 2021, we saw 0.67 pounds per acre. And I show the growing season and the non-growing season here. We did, in 2020, we did see higher loading during the non-growing season, but then in 2021, we did not. And so that goes against, this is important for us to, you know, kind of think about, well, that what we saw from the Midwestern work that said non-growing season loads are always greater, that doesn't necessarily hold true for our systems because we did see um, some significant loading during the, during the growing season. Um, and then, so to frame this, kind of put this in context, these loads, this total phosphorus loss was generally within the range of what's reported elsewhere in the country. I talked about that big review paper. The range reported there was 0.35 to 1.4 pounds per acre. And so we're like smack dab in the middle of that in terms of kind of framing this across the, um, across the body of science around, around tile and phosphorus. Um, and then what I cannot report today is that this was, a, this was a establishing a baseline for these two fields. And really the important question that we're now working on is changing what happens in one of those north and south fields so that we understand the influence of manure injection. So in one of those fields we're injecting right now, we're going to take away manure injection and see how the phosphorus loads change. And then we can attribute that the, the, the increase or decrease to whether it was injected or not. And I, I, that's where I think, you know, the work, we really want to go with our work is understanding how we're going to manage for this and actually, actually. So that's a little bit of context. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it'd be 80 P205. So like 45. Yeah. yeah total pounds of P, so you're still, you know, you're, you're uh, at a very small percentage of the applied, of the applied phosphorus that leaves. We'll compare that to nitrogen here in a minute. Um, so, so the, our third field. So this is a field where we did continuous monitoring for a couple of years. Um, I'm just showing one field uh, or one year of data here. Um, the other year was, was very similar. Um, but looking at hydrographs, these are um, how flashy this tile system was um, where we did see um, when a storm happened, we saw a lot of water moving through the tile. And then I have the total pounds of phosphorus above that little peak in the flow rate. And so when you add all these up, we saw about 1.4 pounds per acre um, per year leaving this field. Um, and in the next year we saw 1.3 pounds per acre per year. So very similar, a little bit higher higher than those other two fields managed exactly the same. Um, what we did see here, uh, which, was, which was interesting and aligns with some of the work from the Midwest, is that we saw uh, about 96% of our phosphorus leaving the field with those storm events. It was not that slow drain base flow. So that aligns with what, we've, what has been um, reported elsewhere. Okay, and then I do want to just take a quick detour to nitrogen. And this is of less water quality concern for us because like I mentioned, our lakes are limited by phosphorus, not, not limited by nitrogen. Um, but this is important, I think, from a farmer's perspective, and at least our clientele there, there's a lot of potential improvements to be made in nitrogen management. Because where we saw 1.4 pounds of phosphorus leaving, we saw 71 pounds um, per acre of nitrogen leaving. So, not necessarily a water quality concern, but nitrogen last time I uh, checked was not, not super cheap. So this is um, certainly, there there's, can be some work here in terms of nutrient management to limit these losses. All right, so conclusions. So we did, so conclusions from, from uh, that group of field studies um, are that air phosphorus loads were typically within ranges reported elsewhere. Um, in losses were a little concerning. We got some extension nutrient management work to do there. Um, and our discharge rates are really driving the overall phosphorus losses. So, and, and, I, and I think that's important to kind of, maybe I'll say it a different way here. Phosphorus concentrations were not very high in our water being discharged, but because we had so much water leaving the field, 
it, it started to add up to be that, you know, kind of to equal that 1.4 pounds per acre per year. It was the volume of water that's driving that, not the concentration of phosphorus. And we also saw, which was really interesting, and what led to some of those higher loads during the growing season versus the non-growing season was that when we have drought periods, at least in our soils, those cracks start to open up and we have more of that preferential flow. And so during the summer could potentially be a higher, a higher period of transport um, if it's a droughty, if it's a droughty year. Um, and we also saw in a drop fall, if we have manure injection, when we have a bunch of open cracks, that manure will at times find those cracks. And it's not, not a huge amount of phosphorus, but that's when we did see the handful of high concentrations was with the manure injection in dry soils. All right, so moving forward. So what are we working on now? So we've done a lot of monitoring at the edge of the field. We're gonna to continue to evaluate best management practices at the field scale, but we're also interested in other te engineering technologies that we can use to control this phosphorus leaving our, our tile drains. And so this is working with uh, a scientist, Dr. Chad Penn out of Indiana on implementing some filters at the end of our, at the end of our tile outlets. And this is just a, a schematic, a, a sample schematic of one where you have kind of tile flowing into a manifold, um, it splits it out into several pipes into something that larger than a septic system, but um, the same idea, you kind of have this, this closed chamber um, and then, then water filters down through a filter media and then enters another manifold where then it exits the field into the, into the discharge into the ditch. So here's one of two that we've just built this past summer, built these in late May, early June. Um, these are called phosphorus removal structures. Um, they essentially act like, like big water filters at the edge of the field. And you can see this is their lower manifold for this particular filter. Um, and in this filter, we actually bring water in, go down, and then force the water back up through the filter media. So we discharge at the top of the filter. And this helps prevent clogging based on some earlier work out in, in Indiana. So we're excited about this. Um, we use a filter media that is 8% um, steel shavings. It's a zero valent iron that we um, bought, uh, shipped in out of Illinois. And it's 8% um, by mass and the rest of it's pea gravel. So it's kind of a, we don't want to use a large gravel because we want to make sure there's a really kind of good contact of water with the media. And we don't want to use too small a gravel because it could potentially clog. So. Um, this is uh, just a, a plot of the media we're using. Um, so we have phosphorus added um, to that media. This is a bench scale. It's so done in a laboratory, um, phosphorus added to that media, and then the, the P percent P removal there on the Y axis. So even after 3000 um, milligrams of P added per kilogram of media, we're still hovering right around 70 to 80% of P removal, which is pretty impressive. And this is what this, um, this iron material looks like. It's the steel shaving, um, which has just tremendous ability to sorb, to sorb phosphorus. So here's another one of the filters. This filter right here um, treats 18.3 acres and it is 10 feet by 12 feet footprint wise. It's two feet thick underground. Um, uses about 10.75 tons of material. That's the, the filter material and the pea gravel. Um, has a retention time of 10 minutes. Um, I kind of mentioned all this. A design life of 15 years. And our initial pea removal was predicted to be 87% of the soluble phosphorus removed from the, the tile drainage discharge. Um, and then at 15 years, it'll be down to 50%. So pretty aggressive um predictions for you know we're still saying we're going to at 15 years we're still going to be removing half of the phosphorus what we've seen so far of june 2022 through Jan january 23 is that we're actually removing 97 percent of the soluble phosphorus and uh, just under 78 percent 
of the total phosphorus. So thus far, we haven't gone through a full winter period yet. Thus far, um, these, these filter um, beds are working really, really well for us. Okay, and I think this is my last slide. And our ongoing research for us just recently released in an effort to better answer this question of um, if a field is tiled or if it's untiled, what's the net effect on total amount of phosphorus leaving that field? We established this series of small watersheds are part of the Discovery Farms Network. Um, I don't know if some of you have heard of that. They have those in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Arkansas and elsewhere. Um, but we're part of that network. We call this Discovery Acres. It's up in St. Albans in Vermont. Um, and we have, like I said, four watersheds, two tiled, two untiled. We're monitoring surface and subsurface flows from both of those. And we've just finished our baseline period this past fall. And starting this spring, we're going to be um, doing business as usual on one of the surf on one of the untiled and tiled fields and doing advanced soil health management practices, no-till and cover cropping and manure injection on one of the on one of the tiled and one of the untiled. And so there's a lot, I hope, that we're going to learn from this, both in terms of best influence of best management practices, but influence of of tile drainage as well on total on the on the um, overall um, impact on loading from fields. All right. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. Nice to get out to uh, Western New York, um, even if the drive over wasn't quite as nice as I was hoping based on this weekend. Uh, but uh, so I'll be covering sort of a, a pretty wide swath of the research we've been doing for about the past decade uh, at Minor Institute. Uh, so uh, Minor Institute is uh, just about as far uh, northeast as you can get in New York. So we're just a, a couple miles off of Lake Champlain and a few miles from the, uh, from the Canadian border. Uh, so we're a research uh, and education facility uh, in addition to having a uh, working farm. Uh, so the farm has about 500 uh, milking cows and we uh, crop about 1,250 acres uh, in an alfalfa get grass and corn rotation. So, you know, generally, depends a bit on the fields, but, you know, roughly four years in corn, and then we switch to four or five years in grass. Um, so uh, we'll start out here with some of the older research. So this is actually research that I did, uh, started in 2013 for my master's. Um, like uh, Joshua said, despite drainage not being anywhere near a new invention, there really has been minimal water quality research. Um, not just in the Northeast, but in, including the Midwest. Uh, and then of that research, a lot has looked at in already tile drained fields, looking at what's coming out of the tiles and what's coming out of the surface. Uh, but as Joshua said, when we drain a field, a lot of that water that might have come off the surface is now going through our tiles. So if we just look at a tile drained field and measure what's coming out of the tile end versus what, com what is coming out of the surface, that doesn't necessarily tell us what the tile is doing, what the field is doing because that field was tile drained. Um, it's telling us or, or what it would have been prior to that drainage. Um, and so what we did in 2013 was we installed uh, some of these, uh, we installed four research plots on a 5% slope. So they're about 75 feet wide by 150 feet long or about a quarter of an acre each. Uh, so there was four of them. So two of them we tile drained and two were left undrained. And then for about a, a year and a half, uh, we monitored these plots and we compared how much phosphorus and water was coming out of the tile drained plots and what was coming out of the plots that were surface drained only. Uh, so you can see some of our setup here uh, at the base of the slope. We just had a PVC pipe cut in half that was collecting that surface water and delivering it into our manholes for collection. You can see in that top middle picture, uh, the top pipe coming in is the surface drainage. Uh, and then the one below is the tile drainage. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little bit of the hydrology first here. So um, generally, we have two different types of events um, when we're looking at surface runoff events. Uh, the first is infiltration excess. And so what this means is when the rain comes so fast and hard, you know, we get three inches in an hour, 
that rain is coming faster than the soil can accept it. You know, maybe other than beach sand, uh, you know, none of our soils are going to be able to collect uh, and uh, allow that much water to infiltrate that quickly. Uh, so when we have these types of high intensity events, you can see here on the um, Y axis, we have the water yield or the runoff. And just to put so these numbers in perspective, uh, if you divide the um, numbers by about by 10, uh, you get about um, uh, what we would see for gallons per acre. So 10,000 liters per hectare is about 1,100 gallons per acre. Uh, but so what we see here is the uh, red line is our surface runoff from those uh, undrained plots. We'll call them undrained. They do have surface drainage, but I'll, I'll say undrained to refer to the fact that they don't have tile drainage. So that red line is the surface drainage uh, from those undrained plots, uh, the average of those two plots that did not have drainage. And then the light green line is the surface drainage from those tile drained plots. <laughs> So you can see not, not a whole lot of difference between those two lines. The tiles aren't really doing anything in these types of events. Uh, you can see a little bit later on into the event, we do start to see that tile flow increase, but uh, you know that's really not, not going to make any impact unless near the end of the event, we got another rainfall. In contrast here, we have what are known as saturation excess flows. So this is when, you know, the rain may not be coming too hard and fast, but it's coming consistently. We have three straight days of rain, uh, as we see here for this event, starting on June 11th, ending on June 14th. Uh, again, that red line is the surface drainage from those undrained plots. The uh, light green line is the surface drainage from those drained plots, and then the green, again, the tile drainage. And so what we can see is uh, pretty significant spikes in the uh, red undrained uh, surface. But while we do see some spikes in that uh, surface drainage from the tiled plots, uh, they're generally of much uh, less magnitude and typically of a shorter duration. Uh, that dark green line, though, we see uh, really starts to go up and up and up with that with those flows increasing over the course of this three day steady rain event. Uh, and then finally, um, a third type of event that we commonly get is snow melt. Uh, this tends to be, uh, it can be really a combination of infiltration excess or saturation excess, uh, where we see those, um, the surface runoff for the uh, tile drained plots does pop up a little bit there right at the beginning of the event uh, when we have some rain and snow uh, colliding, you know, not, not quite enough infiltration to, to keep up with that. But very quickly, we see that dark green line of the tile uh, spiking up and it stays continually raised uh, above any of our other sources. Uh, as it is removing uh, all of that water from the subsurface. Uh, and with all of that water draining from the subsurface, we see much less surface runoff uh, than in those uh, undrained plots. Uh, so that's, that's the hydrology that's interesting, but really what does that mean for uh, phosphorus loss? And so here we're looking at that same snowmelt event. Um, and so we can see, again, that tile line, dark green line, that's bringing uh, by far the most flow. But then we see all the way down at the bottom of this graph now, that is that tile drainage and the phosphorus it's delivering. And each of these points represents an hourly sample um, that we uh, collected over the two day period of this event. Uh, so, you know, we collected about 130 samples um, over, this, over this two day period. Um, but so much less, uh, despite having much, uh, you know, two thirds more flow from those tile drained plots, we had 50% less phosphorus. So two thirds more flow, almost all of that was tile drainage, but in the end, 50% less phosphorus was delivered. So uh, lower concentrations were able to account for the fact that uh, we had much more water draining from the field. And then looking at this uh, roughly uh, 14 month study here, uh, we look first in the first graph on the left hand side, uh, the TD plots or those tile drained plots in green, uh, followed by the undrained plots in red. 
Uh, so if we look at SRP or our bioavailable form of P, this is the form of P that our plants are going to use, but also uh, what uh, will lead to algae blooms uh, immediately in our lakes. Uh, so we saw uh, a bit more um, SRP being lost from those undrained plots. Uh, the next uh, over PP is particulate phosphorus. So that's generally what's going to be a uh, already attached to those soil particles. So when we see erosion uh, and sediment leaving the fields, as Joshua said, phosphorus loves to stick to sediment. So a lot of times when we have more erosion, we're going to see more phosphorus loss. Um, a little surprising, we saw more of that in TD. Really, this is uh, due to experimental error. There's uh, some variability between these plots, but, um, and then if we look at total P, uh, our third set of, of bars, we can see virtually identical losses. Uh, so we lost about three and a half times more water. There was about three and a half times more drainage from those tile drained plots. But ultimately that didn't lead to any difference in, uh, in total P losses. Uh, and then the final uh, columns there are TSS or total suspended solids. That's our measure of, er of erosion or sediment leaving the fields. Uh, and there you can see that uh, we did have uh, about you know, two to three times more erosion from those undrained plots. Not terribly surprising uh, given what we know about um, you know, uh, erosion uh, production. And then if we look at the next graph on the right, now here we're looking at the uh, contribution from the individual pathways from those tile drain plots. So again, dark green is our surface runoff, light green is our tile drainage, and pretty much across the board, we can see at least for our pea species, uh, Roughly 50-50, um, you know, a, a little bit, a little bit more coming from the tile drainage, but but not too much different. Uh, and again, this is despite the fact that you know uh, our tile drainage waters are contributing about 50% um, of that total P load, while representing 95% of the total flows from that field. So surface runoff was only 5% of the total drainage from these fields, and yet because surface drainage is so much higher typically in our phosphorus concentrations, we're seeing that still contribute a large, uh, a large majority, or at least a, a significant proportion, I should say, um, of our total P loads, despite being such a small portion of the water budget. And then these are these, uh, this is just a table here from these uh, same plots for the next four years when we went into the alfalfa grass rotation, we, um, ended up having tile drainage in the other two plots that had previously been untiled. Uh, so now we're just breaking this down by what is coming from the surface and what is coming from the tiles. Um, and what we see here, uh, you see the note up at the top that about 100 grams per hectare is about a tenth of a pound per acre. So if we're looking at our total P losses, we're at about a quarter of a pound per acre, two tenths to a quarter of a pound per acre. Uh, now, if we look at this table, you can look through the years to see the variability. Uh, as far as total P, you know, we're ranging anywhere from our total amounts of, uh, you know, about a little less than 0.2 pounds per acre up to about a half pound per acre. Uh, so in the ballpark of, of what we saw when this field was in corn. Um, but if we look at the at that bottom dark uh, dark blue lines where we're looking at the averages across the four years, um, we're seeing again about uh, you know 0.3 pounds per acre. But again, the majority of that is coming from the surface, even though uh, you know we're losing about three quarters of our water through the tile drainage. But the 25% of surface runoff is providing 75% of the load. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's always uh, reversed generally as we see that the small drainage contribution of surface runoff is still able to contribute as much or more than uh, what's coming out of our tiles. And again, this was in the alfalfa grass rotation uh, rather than corn. Uh, and the one difference we did see, not a big difference in total P, uh, but we saw a much higher fraction of SRP uh, in our total P. So in 
sort of if we look across all of the studies that we've done in cornfields, typically SRP is about one third uh, to a half of what uh, of the total P. Whereas in this situation, we're seeing about three quarters of that total P being bioavailable. Uh, and this isn't necessarily um, too surprising if we're thinking about that we're in the alfalfa grass rotation. This isn't getting incorporated, it's getting broadcast. Um, there's no tillage, right? Because we're, we're in the grass rotation in a perennial stand that allows more opportunity uh, for those large pores or preferential flow pathways that Joshua spoke about to form. Uh, and so when that happens, we can get a little bit more direct connection between the surface where we're applying the manure and the tiles. Uh, ultimately, again, we didn't see that drastically increase our total P losses, but it did change that fraction of P uh, a little bit more towards the bioavailable form. So now switching, uh, switching studies, we're going, so that project that I just uh, presented was looking at uh, plot level research, right, quarter acre plots, uh, which can provide a lot of uh, information, but not necessarily um, entirely reflective of what's happening at the field scale. Uh, so this was our next step. Um, a few years later, after the uh, plot study, we installed this project uh, where we have two six acre fields. Uh, one was tiled and one was left untiled. Uh, they're both uh, pretty, pretty con consistently uh, a Tonawanda soil or a somewhat poorly drained silt loam. Uh, minimal slope in both these fields, essentially just enough to, to get it to our monitoring, uh, to our surface runoff monitoring um, locations at, at the edge of each of the fields. Uh, and generally, um, and four foot depth, 25 foot spacing. So uh, just like Joshua was saying, is commonly seen nowadays. Um, and these fields, uh, again, were corn. Uh, we're seeing them here in grass before they were tiled, uh, but they are in corn for the project and received spring manure applications uh, that were tilled in uh, the same day of, of application. Uh, so here we'll just look at some of the sampling equipment. So you can see what we have at the edge of fields to collect surface runoff. So we have a black, uh, what's called an H flume. Uh, so these fiberglass structures come pre-calibrated. Uh, they're sized appropriately for the amount of runoff we expect to get from a field. Uh, and so all of our fields are surrounded by ditches that may all connect to this one corner, uh, as well as berms and ditches outside the fields that make sure that any water from outside the fields isn't coming on. And then conversely, any, field, any water that starts in the field isn't escaping before it gets to our monitoring locations. Um, and so the, the water from this uh, here, we're looking at um, an eight and a half acre field all ends up at this corner of the field where we can measure the water height, convert that to flow. Uh, and we're measuring that, uh, that water flow every 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and as uh, Joshua is doing, we're taking flow proportional samples. What that means is uh, for a six acre field, uh, we're taking a sample every uh, about 3,800 gallons. Uh, that goes into a, uh, into a container for three or four days. Every 3,800 gallons of drainage that goes by takes another sample, uh, puts it in the container, and then after the runoff event, we come and collect that from, uh, from the field and take it back to our in-house lab for uh, different phosphorus and nitrogen analyses. Uh, today, I'm going to be focusing on phosphorus. As Joshua said, that's, that's our primary nutrient of interest in, in these freshwater systems, uh, but uh, we do have all of this information collected for nitrogen as well. Uh, so you can see we have a sample intake line at the end, at the back end of that flume, uh, some uh, different equipment that's communicating with each other so that the water level reader is communicating with our sampler. Uh, so those two are in constant communication to make sure that uh, we are taking those samples uh, when we want to. So in contrast, the previous um, project that we were looking at, we were taking samples every hour and, individu and individually monitor, uh, measuring those samples. Here instead, we have a 16 liter bottle uh, that is uh, one single composite sample. Uh, and then again, rather than being a time-based sampling, uh, it's, it's flow-based. So regardless of how fast or slow uh, that water is flowing, we, we're equally uh, representing what, what the, the average condition over the course of an event is.
So here you can see a snow snow melt runoff event uh, as that water starts to, to pond up and, and move a little bit faster off the field. We see it rising in height in the flume as that height rises. Uh, we, we know there's more flow coming through. Um, here we have uh, tile drainage sampling location. Uh, so we look in, we've got our, our equipment intersecting the uh, tile drainage outlet at the edge of the field. Uh, we've got a flow meter um, and that auto sampler that are communicating again. And um, as that, again, as that water is rising in the uh, tile line, uh, that uh, sampler and flow meter are continuously measuring that and, and sampling accordingly. So then looking at sort of the five-year data set from that project, if we look at the graphs on the left, this is our runoff. Uh, and so we have for TD, again, the tile-drained field, UD is the undrained field. Uh, and then in these set of graphs, the uh, light blue hatch mark portion represents the tile drainage portion. Um, and then that uh, blue cap uh, or the entire blue bar represents the amount of surface runoff. So for that TD field in 2018, we see about four, uh, just over four inches per year of runoff uh, from the tile and uh, just about two inches of surface runoff per year. Uh, but so if we look, you know, again, see some variability through the years, but if we look at that last column where we have cumulative uh, roughly about two thirds of our drainage uh, in this field is coming from uh, the tile drainage system, uh, about one third from surface runoff. Uh, but we do see about, um, you know, about a third less drainage uh, from that undrained field. So without tile drainage, uh, as expected, we have lower, yield, lower uh, drainage volumes, uh, higher drainage volumes that is dominated by the tile drainage portion. Um, in our tile drained field. So then transitioning to the graph on the right, uh, here we're looking TDT is the tile from the, uh, the tile contribution from the tile drained field. TDS is the surface from that tile drained field. And then UDS is surface runoff from that undrained field. Uh, so again, looking through the years, uh, we see a, a decent amount of variability. Um, but we see relatively consistently or very consistently that, uh, again, that tile drainage proportion, two thirds of the total amount of drainage, but again, a much smaller fraction of that total phosphorus load. Uh, and then you can see here that on these uh, set of graphs, that light green hatch marked portion is the SRP or bioavailable P. Uh, so in this field, we can see uh, a, lot of our, uh, a lot of our phosphorus load is coming from uh, either particulate phosphorus from that sediment or organic phosphorus uh, from, from manure applications. Uh, but generally for our TD fields, uh, or, or for TD versus UD, right, we're not seeing too much of a difference. Uh, 0.04 plus 0.17, you know, we're at about 0.2. Uh, so, we, you know, we're, we're about maybe a third less than that UDS field. Uh, we need to be a little bit careful with this experimental de design. Uh, we're doing some future work um, that's similar to what Joshua presented. We can't necessarily assign uh, causation to tile drainage yet, uh, but when we look at these two fields, um, you know, very similar uh, with, with the only major difference being tile drainage, it's, it's reasonable to assume that, um, you know, some of these, uh, some of these differences are being driven by that tile drainage. Uh, but so lower losses um, consistently, relatively consistently in our tile drained field with the majority of those losses still coming from the surface again. Uh, and then similar to our uh, previous two projects, uh, we're seeing in, in the ballpark, right, of, of a quarter pound per acre losses. So now uh, this is not looking at any individual project. Uh, this is sort of the database of water quality samples that we've collected. Uh, so this is almost 1,500 tile drainage samples, a little under 300 surface runoff samples. Uh, and so here we're just looking at the concentration of those samples. So not worrying about the total amount of drainage yet, here we're just looking at, at the concentrations. And um, 
I'll point out at the bottom right here, you can see that 0.02 milligrams per liter of total phosphorus is roughly where we start to see issues arising in lakes with algae blooms and, and those types of water quality concerns. Uh, but the challenge is in crop fields, we generally want to see tenfold more than that. We want to see about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 milligrams per liter of phosphorus in our soil solution in order to support our crop growth. So the challenge is what we need in our soils is very different than what happens in the lakes. Uh, but so if we start out here looking, I apologize, I can't use my pointer on this screen, but if we look here at the uh, surface uh, of total P on the left-hand side, we're seeing SRP um, and what has come from the surface and what is coming from the tiles. On the right-hand side, we're seeing total P concentrations, again, surface and tiles. Uh, this is all from cornfields, I should mention, that uh, alfalfa grass study is not included in here. Um, so here we're kind of looking at mostly apples to apples, all corn silage fields, all getting uh, roughly equivalent manure applications, um, at least relevant to uh, their, their particular fertility uh, status, uh, and all receiving tillage. Um, so we see here, this line in the middle of our box represents the 50th percentile. So 50% of our samples are below 0.2 milligrams per liter for surface runoff. And then these next two lines, the, the outer lines of that box are the 25th and 75th percentile, which match up with these two values here in our table. Uh, and then finally, uh, these what we call whiskers represent uh, where we expect, based on this data set, the majority of our samples to fall within. So anything above that, these dots, are considered outliers. Uh, but so what we see here, um, if we start out on the right hand or on the left hand side, um, if we're looking at surface runoff uh, for SRP, we're seeing, um, you know we're still below that, that 0.02, this is of total P, but um, for surface, but if we look over here, right, we're at 0 .0, roughly 0 0.02 in the 50th percentile for surface, That's we're still less than half of that uh, for our um, tile drainage samples. So 75% of our tile drainage samples are coming in at 0 0.007 milligrams per liter or less. Uh, and then we can see if we're looking at our outliers here, you know, we've got, got a number of outliers here, uh, but really nothing that is exceeding one milligram per liter. In contrast with surface runoff, we've got uh, a healthy number, what do we've got close to 10 that are greater than that one milligram per liter um, and still, you know, uh, almost 25% of our samples are, you know, at that 0.1 milligrams per liter or higher. Uh, then if we look over here at total P, um, if we start out looking at the tiles, again, uh, 25th percentile, we're less than 0.007. And it's really not up until we get close to the 75th percentile that we start to exceed that threshold. Um, but again, when we're when we're draining any any water, right, whether it's surface runoff or tile drainage, that water will be diluted. So generally, um, one rule of thumb that uh, that the EPA has put out is that um, they should be less than 0.1 milligrams per liter. You know that that could still arguably, uh, depending on how much water it is, uh, create some issues. But uh, again, for this tile drainage. Uh, for less than 50% or for uh, more than 50% of our samples, we wouldn't even really need to worry about diluting those uh, samples in order to um, meet that threshold. Uh, again, some outliers heading up towards one milligrams per liter, uh, but, you know, say 15 uh, outliers that are at that one milligram per liter or greater for surface runoff. So, you know, pretty pretty consistently here, we're seeing much, much lower concentrations from the tile drainage than surface runoff. Uh, but again, uh, as we talked about before, there is um, 
a lot more drainage coming from our tile drained field. So with that extra drainage, you know, potentially we could see, you know, there could be enough that it could overwhelm the surface runoff losses based on what we've seen from the pre previous two projects uh, that that is generally unlikely in the type of work uh, situations that that we're doing this research. Um, but so here now we're adding uh, for each of our fields where we have uh, annual losses, we have combined those flows with the concentrations to give us our loads. Uh, so here these uh, graphs are in kilograms per hectare per year, which is roughly equivalent to pounds per acre per year. Uh, pounds per acre per year would be about 10% less. Uh, but so looking at here field I in 2019 as an example, uh, similar to a previous graph, that hatch marked portion is the tile contribution. So just a bit over 0.2. Uh, the remainder, that solid portion, is what's coming from the surface, and then we add those two together to get the 0.66 uh, kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, but so these now these arrows are pointing to uh, a field where we have uh, six years of continuous data um, from a cornfield. Uh, so we can see, you know, upwards of a uh, half pound of SRP per acre, um, or per acre per year, um, but we also have some years where we're almost seeing no loss from those fields. Uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, we had virtually no phosphorus leaving these fields, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 pounds per acre. Uh, so this is one of the things that makes, um, you know, drainage research and, um, you know, drainage monitoring in general such a challenge. Uh, you know, point sources, you've got a water treatment location, you know, you know where that water's coming out of that you need to sample, you know where it's coming out of, when it's coming out of, how much, none of that is in question. With these fields, we can see very different situations uh, from year to year, and this could be related, you know, often strongly related to weather, but, you know, when are we getting those manure applications onto the field in relation to that weather? Um, if we look here at this, uh, you know, sort of outlier relative much higher than the rest. Uh, and then also in contrast uh, with this field H in 2019, we're seeing the vast majority coming from tile drainage. Whereas if we look kind of across all of those other bars that have any significant height, pretty much we're looking at solid, um, solid portions, which means it's coming from the surface. Uh, this field H in 2019 uh, is a bit different. We also saw uh, much higher losses than usual. Uh, and we'll get into a bit why that, why that may have happened in the next slide. Uh, but so generally, uh, if we're looking at the averages, I should say, uh, again, we're about one third of our SRP load coming from the tiles and about two thirds coming from the surface or about 0.2 kilograms per hectare uh, per year total uh, across these roughly, what is it, 25 site years. And again, that's despite the fact that for this data set, 83% of our drainage was coming from tiles. Now, if we're looking at the total P load here, uh, we've got, um, Again, looking at those same fields that we looked at on the previous slide, uh, again, jumping back and forth uh, a bit up towards uh, uh, upwards of a half pound per acre, a little more, uh, but down to less than a tenth of a pound per acre of total P. And now if we're looking again at this sort of outlier high, uh, high contribution field, uh, again, the majority is coming from the tile drainage. Uh, but what we know about this field that really isn't entirely unexpected, this is a quite a flat field. Uh, we rarely see surface drainage uh, from this field. Uh, and so a lot of, regardless, a lot of drainage is happening through our tile system. We also, this is a heavier clay soil. So more of those large cracks can form, uh, which also increases the, um, the rate at which surface water can be delivered to the tiles. Um, on top of that, this is one of our, uh, most of these fields, uh, fields H and I, I should say, probably most of you can't see that, but uh, these two here, here, and here, 
or the same fields across three years. Uh, those fields are in the high range of soil test P, whereas the other fields are more in, situated in the medium range. Uh, so again, that's probably contributing in part to this, uh, that higher soil test P. Uh, is likely related to the fact that this is a field right near the barn, has a longer history of manure application. Um, it had been, uh, they had been not had tile drainage uh, previous to the project. Uh, and so uh, more organic matter was built up in the field, just general, uh, much higher fertility than our other fields. Uh, but we can see all of those risk factors were the same across 2019, 2020, and 21. You know, the soil pea didn't change. You know, the history of those fields didn't change. They were still in corn. But what did change is uh, in 2019, or where we see those spikes up, we had two large snow melts shortly after manure application. Uh, so unfortunately, we were shorthanded. Uh, we were not able to incorporate manure immediately as, as it is applied. Normally, we were getting back two, three days later to till that in. Uh, this winter storm sort of caught everyone by surprise, got a foot of snow before that uh, manure could be incorporated um, from that surface application. Uh, so then about two weeks later, we got another foot of snow. And then a couple weeks after that, we had warm weather and rain and all of that snow uh, left very, very quickly. And so within about a week, uh, we had an incredible amount of water moving through our fields. Uh, and with that water, we saw more phosphorus. Uh, now, again, I can't directly say that incorporation would have completely changed this, but looking at what we know based on what's happened in other events across other years, likely that incorporation was a major factor. Uh, and so this is, right, this is a challenge. We go from 85 degrees to snowing, uh, you know, it, it things can change quick. Uh, and so uh, some of these practices that we know um, are going to help um, it looks like we can as long as we can, you know, get uh, get the bodies and the equipment in order to do it. Uh, but the good news is, again, you know, we, we struggled that one year, uh, but the next year when we were able to get it incorporated before that snow uh, and, you know, rainy, really wet period of the fall and spring came, uh, despite that higher soil test P, higher clay content, you know, we dropped much closer to the average of, of about a half pound per acre per year. Um, so right, that's that's the good news. We do have some risk, um, you know, getting upwards of, of two pounds per acre, but um, well, those there's those fields. Um, but to put this in some perspective, right, so we are um, on average applied about 0.4 pounds per acre per year, uh, or I'm sorry, lost right, 0.4 pounds per acre per year or thereabouts. Uh, if we divide that by the average application rate of 26 uh, pounds or uh, kilograms of, um, of phosphorus, we're seeing only about 1.4% of what we applied lost. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at these losses of a half a pound or a pound or two pounds, you know, even two pounds where that kind of spikes up and looks, you know, looks looks a little scary. In reality, when we put this in perspective with the manure that's being applied to the field, uh, that 26.1 is, is roughly equivalent to what that crop is going to remove. Um, so generally, as long as we're sort of, you know, staying within the bounds of, of what our crops are going to use, not, uh, not massively over applying relative to the field's fertility status, generally we're seeing very small rates of loss. Uh, and so, you know, right, if, if you're doing, you know, Think of any other industry, 98, 99% effective, that sounds great. In our situation, it's still not good enough. And so, like I'd said on a previous slide, that 0.02 milligrams per liter eutrophication threshold. Phosphorus is our limiting nutrient. It's very scarce in the environment, particularly in our lakes. And so any little bit of phosphorus has the potential to create issues. But the challenge is biological systems are leaky, right? We're applying uh, practices to large acres, uh, you know, large, large land areas. And so, you know, 
trying to get that into a completely closed system uh, when we're dealing with, you know, something like soil, groundwaters, uh, you know, it's, it's a big challenge. So with the practices that we're already utilizing, uh, some of those, you know, practices like having uh, strong nutrient management plans, incorporating that phosphorus uh, into the soils, you know, we're, we're, we're down pretty low. Um, but again, the challenge is how do we get at that last little half pound, pound, that last 1% um, that, is, that is still managing to leak out of our fields. Um, and then I'll just say, uh, you know, we're, we're averaging here about 0.4 half pounds per acre. We saw maybe double that in Joshua's work. Uh, my suspicion is he's working in much heavier clay soils, and that is likely, you know, the presence of those macropores, especially in, uh, you know, dry weather, those large clay cracks. We see some cracking in our soils, right? We've got some clay, but it's not 90% clay like he sees. Uh, you know, we're more in a clay loam situation, uh, which, uh, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but I think is more of the situation that we're in out here. Um, you know, not those Addison County, you know, 90 to 100% clays. Um, and so I, I suspect um, some of this data might be a bit more relevant um, since we have a little bit more similar soils uh, to what to what you folks have out here. Uh, so just a quick um, plug for our ongoing research. Um, as I said, that uh, tiled versus non-tiled project, we're sort of switching gears into a next uh, phase of the experiment that will allow us hopefully to attribute more causation to the drainage differences. Uh, so that will go on for a few more years and then we hope um, that that will eventually transition into a no-till plus cover crop project uh, comparison with uh, without uh, cover crops and with tillage. Uh, we have another project that we're about two-thirds of the way through that is looking at the impacts of a winter rye cover crop um, as, as the only treatment, so not including till, um, a tillage treatment. And then on the other side, we have another project that is looking at no-till in isolation. Uh, so we're looking at cover crops in isolation, no-till in isolation, and then hopefully shortly down the road, we'll be able to combine those into a project to see what is the, what is the cumulative value and, you know, are, are they greater than the sum of their parts? Um, we're also looking to set up a, a larger series of research plots. Uh, which will allow us to ask questions uh, really over a shorter period of time. The research project, the research design that we've been working with a lot uh, really requires anywhere between four to six years of, of data collection. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, we'd all like the answers sooner, but um, if we have a, a series of research plots where we can have more observations per year that will give us the ability to ask questions and, and get those answers in a shorter period of time. Uh, we're also potentially going to be looking at um, the impacts, the water quality impacts of some of those uh, commercial products some of you may have heard about. I'm sure the farmers definitely have uh, that claim to stimulate uh, soil and production through uh, biological pathways. Uh, so one of my colleagues has done some work with corn yields um, in, in collaboration with the Cornell folks, uh, but then we'll also be seeing, you know, whether, whether there's any water quality impacts as well. Uh, and then finally, one I forgot to add on here, it's um, currently the first two years are going to be a lab portion uh, at Clarkson before um, ending up in the fields at, at Minor, but we will be doing a uh, tile drainage filter project. Um, as well. And so this is this is largely being driven by the engineering folks at Clarkson. Uh, but the advantage of this uh, of this filter would be that they envision it being a much smaller footprint uh, than some of the larger uh, larger scale um, options that that uh, Joshua has been working with. Um, but that is still um, still sort of in the works. And a few few years down the line, uh, we'll be um, implementing that project in the field. But so generally our take home messages, right? Said it a few times I think here today, uh, the majority of our P losses are occurring in surface runoff, even in our tile drained fields. Um, because despite that small, small portion of the water budget, the concentrations in surface runoff are just so much higher, generally speaking. Um, 
in very flat fields, we might see situations because surface runoff, it takes a whole lot before we start to see that surface runoff happening. This is, oh, that's you. Okay. I was like, is this a battery warning? <laughs> that's okay. Um, uh, but yeah, so in very flat fields where we see minimal surface runoff regardless, you know, we, we, it wouldn't be unexpected to see tile drainage losses exceeding surface runoff in those situations. But again, in those fields, we weren't planting corn because they were too wet. Um, and so this is right. This is, this is another question of, you know, do we, if, if we're trying to reduce the intensity of drainage or we're not tile draining fields in order to get the same yields, the same crop production, we're going to have to ha use more land. Um, and, you know, with, with tile drainage, we're able to be more productive on our given footprint. Um, and so that's, you know, that's certainly something uh, to consider. And then our losses, again, do represent a very small fraction of applied P, about one and a half percent of what we're applying is being recovered in that drainage. Um, I didn't hit this too hard, but the majority of, uh, of our phosphorus losses are occurring during a very short window of time. Typically during snowmelt, uh, that snowmelt event that, that we zoomed in on uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, that two-day snowmelt event contributed 50% of the total P losses from that entire year in both of those plots. Um, again, it was only about a tenth of, or what, point, point 0.1 pounds, a tenth of a pound per acre, but um, again, very, very short windows of time when these large events are occurring is, is uh, often what's leading to these, uh, to these losses. And so, you know, 95% of the time we're seeing those tile drains flow. Generally, it's going to be relatively clear water, uh, at least from a phosphorus perspective. Um, but during those events, uh, things can change pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty we don't know, but um, there are certainly risk factors that we're well aware of, which is, like I mentioned just before, making sure that if we are surface applying manure because we don't have injection equipment, that that is being tilled in. Um, this is where there's a challenge. If, if we've got no-till farms that don't have that injection equipment, you know, there, there can be some, some potential concerns there. So, you know, we're trying to address one resource concern, erosion, soil health, um, but um, on the flip side, you know, that could be having some, some impacts on, on our phosphorus losses. And so that's what some of our future research uh, is going to try and hone in on a bit more. Um, uh, manure application relative to our weather events, um, trying to get that manure applied um, as far as we can from that non-growing season. So whether that's applying in the spring or trying to get that on as early as possible in the fall uh, and getting that incorporated. Uh, paying attention to our nutrient management plans. So, you know, there's just so much we can do about fields that 50 years ago were getting over applied. Uh, phosphorus doesn't move too quickly. So, you know, a lot of our farms are dealing with the legacy of previous management before, before the science is where it is today. Um, so managing those fields appropriately, as well as, you know, paying attention to our nutrient management plans so we're not uh, having that buildup occur uh, anymore. And then finally, um, you know, macropores uh, forming preferential flow pathways forming in heavier clay soils or where we have no-till, uh, you know, making sure, particularly with our manure application, that, that we're paying attention to that. So again, whether that's tillage to disrupt those macropores, um, uh, as well as some, you know, some other potential options. <laughs>